A few weeks ago, we talked with Louis Nichols about the importance of having a good newsletter that helps people, something targeted, an educational resource. Brennan Dunn knows a thing or two about that and has built an empire around segmentation and personalization. Last time he was on the show, we talked about right message. Today, We talked to him about email templates and newsletter strategies that we can implement with his new tool, Palladio. I'm really excited for you to hear this conversation with Brennan where he equates emails to sales pages, where he talks about how to run sales in the middle of sequences and creating evergreen newsletters. It's going to be great. And I know you're going to learn a ton, especially if you, like me, are trying to grow your newsletter. In Build Something More, we talk about how he built Palladio, the virtues of a minimum viable product and email client issues. If you are interested in hearing an ad-free extended version of this and every episode of How I Built It, you can head on over to joincreatorcrew.com. Com. This episode is brought to you by Learn Dash and WP Wally. You'll hear about them later in the show. But for now, let's get on to the intro and then the interview. Hey, everybody, and welcome to How I Built It, the podcast that helps small business owners create engaging content that drives sales. Each week, I talk about how you can build good content faster to increase revenue and establish yourself as an authority. I'm your host, Joe Casabona. Now let's get to it. All right, I am here with Brennan Dunn. He is the founder of Create and Sell, Write Message, Palladio, and a bunch of other things. He's a busy guy. Uh, I don't know how he does it all because I know that he also has some number of children. Uh, right. Uh, I think they might be a little older than mine. Actually, that might not even be true. And let's bring Brennan in and then we can talk about it. Brennan, how are you today? I'm good. How are you, Joe? I'm great. Uh, and and for, for the record, I've got two two older kids, 10 and 13, and then a one-year-old. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, most of yours are older than most of mine, uh, but I have a yeah. four-month-old at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming back on the show. I think I had you on a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. post Cabo Press, talking about yep. right message. Um, and segmentation, personalization. I, at, I'm i glad I'm having you on now because I finally did all of that. I, I cleaned up my ConvertKit account. I Sweet. got rid of so many unnecessary tags. Um, I'm trying to use custom fields more. I'm not using them quite. Like You're like a master at this. Maybe we could talk about that. Um, but uh, I have like four segments and I have emails uh, sequences for specific segments. And I'm excited to finally be focusing my efforts on that. So, um, and that was all thanks in part to you and that first Cabo press I went to where, um, we talked about like the, the need for, I like signed up for convert kit that day that Chris talked about it. Um, oh, nice. Very and cool. then, uh, and then I started getting into more of the segmentation stuff. So, um, awesome. but, yeah, so uh, the listeners, if I did my intro right, I'm, I'm breaking the fourth wall. If I did my intro right, we <laughs> I've already kind of talked a little bit about you. And so um, they know we're going to talk about Palladio today, which is a super awesome tool. I signed up, I signed up like the day you launched it, uh, which I'm now very grateful for because I think it switched, switched to a subscription model. Is that right? It's going, it's going proper SaaS. Yeah. It's so going you got proper the, you got the LTD. Yes. Yeah. You, you got the lifetime deal. <laughs> One of the only lifetime deals I actually use. Uh, <laughs> uh, so maybe we can start off with uh, what is Palladio? And, uh, or I'm, I'll try to say it with my Italian, right? The Palladio. Um, Palladio. Yeah. Uh, what is it? And maybe how did you come up with the name? Sure. So, um, okay. So what, what Palladio is, is imagine Webflow, but for email. Mm-hmm. So it's just an easy way to visually uh, create not only email templates. So we think of email templates as being the shell, like a WordPress template, right? like mm-hmm. the thing around the content. Yeah, but it's also a tool for creating and and uh, using widgets, which are kind of like, I mean, to get WordPress. Since I know a lot of your listeners use WordPress, yeah. it would be like adding uh, Gutenberg elements or something like that. Yeah, right. Like that that are a little more. Than just rich text. So you think of most like email content as being headings, 
italic text, bold text, images, and that's kind of it. Uh, Palladio allows you to create really anything you want um, that you can then add directly in line to your emails. Yeah, and that's like that's pretty important, right? Because like ConvertKit, they switched to a more a more block like editor recently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but there's still like a, this kind of weird handshake you need to do with like their widgets slash snippets slash uh, like reusable areas. Um, and unless you're really uh, adept at HTML and liquid, which is what my weak point um, and like under, I guess understand how email clients work. Like all of those things have to converge for you to do this properly on your own. Um, That's right. And, and Palladio kind of handles all of that for you. Yeah. And that, that was the goal. I mean, it, it started out, well, let me, let me answer the name thing and then yeah, I'll oh tell yeah. you about the origins. So uh, back in, at, in university, I uh, studied kind of the, the classics, right? So we did a lot of stuff with the, Greeks and Romans and everything else. And we kind of made our way through Western civilization. One of the people we, we focused on was uh, Andrea Palladio, who was the a Renaissance architect in Italy who kind of brought, uh, brought architecture into the modern age, right? So that's kind of the, the parallel here is this is the way to kind of bring email to uh, the Renaissance, if you will, of um, email designs. So that's... Yeah, I just picked the name for that reason. That's fantastic. I love that. I mean, as an Italian American, I absolutely <laughs> love that. Uh, so now I'm going to look up Andrea Palladio. Um, yeah, and I think you uh, a quick side quest, but I think you also got me into uh, some of the Stoics reading. Right, I I was reading um, the Ryan Holiday book. Ryan Holiday book. Uh, All right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we we read. Yeah. Um, we read and translated Epictetus, uh, Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, and stuff like that in in, uh, in college too. I never, I haven't read actually Ryan's stuff, but I know he does a good job at kind of, um, I don't know, packaging it up for yeah, the right. It like it's like a primer, right? But you're the one who kind of encouraged me to like read the source material, and after that, okay, I cool. read uh, Meditations, um, and <laughs> yes. I have Seneca's on deck. I have a personal retreat coming up, and so I have Seneca on deck for that. Yeah. Um, hopefully, hopefully yeah. Ryan's a little less, uh, again, I haven't, I haven't read his stuff, but I know like, I think it's Epictetus who talks about things like, you know, if basically things like if your child dies or something, just realize that's yeah. fine. And yeah, you know, like <laughs> that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> it can be a little, little brutal he, for, for the modern. Yeah. Reader. You know, it's funny cause he does mention that and I'm like, you have kids now, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess that's the that's if you're fully embracing the philosophy. Um, maybe yeah. we could talk about that more and uh, and build something more. Which, um, by the way, I didn't mention the episode number, nor do I have it handy here. Uh, but the show notes you'll be able to find over at howibuilt.it slash 267. There it is. I bounced back. Um, so everything that we talk about here and you can sign up for... Uh, the Creator Crew, where you'll be able to get ad-free extended episodes of this podcast, uh, where Brendan and I will talk about a bunch of other stuff, maybe how he built Palladio and uh, the Stoics and stuff like that. So um, so uh, instead of jumping into the how for this episode, let's talk about the the why. Maybe we alluded to it earlier, but um, what, what encouraged you to do this? Yeah, so I was, um, you know, for the longest time, I was very dyed in the wool with kind of the, uh, the way I think a lot of us when we when we got started with email marketing uh, thought, which is plain text is or plain emails are best because um, they look more like a, from a real person, right? Like I wouldn't send you a personal email that had like grids. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I, would, I would send you something that was like, "Hey Joe, you know, new line and and, and stuff like that." Yeah. So. That was that was my initial thinking, and then I started to do you know with the, the real petri dish for me was W Freelancing, which um, was kind of the company that I kind of led to what I'm everything I'm doing now. Um, which with that, the big the big kind of takeaway there, and I, I forgot where I heard this, but somebody said something like, "There's a reason we don't have um, we don't generally write sales pages in Google Docs." And I know many of us might start that way, but when it comes to things like consumption and people, you know, skimming 
uh, especially sales emails and like longer emails and stuff like that. You know, structure is a big thing, and it's good to have clear divisions between thematic sections. And I know what I, what I started to see was that people would use um, creative uses of headings and like emojis to do this. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. like they'd have like they break apart or break up different sections of their emails with like different emoji headings and and things like that. Uh, but what I wanted to do was I wanted to find a way to easily using the the tools I already use. Because obviously Amazon and like e-commerce companies do a lot with graphical and designed emails, Mm -hmm. right? Like they typically, yeah, I mean, they've they've been doing that for ages. Um, But I wanted to find a way that I could do something like that where I could, you know, starting with like call to action areas and things that I really want to stand out where before I was doing like the little emoji pointer, uh, you know, thing with then like the URL and saying click here in bold. Um, which obviously, I mean, that I'm not saying that doesn't work, but I wanted to find a way to make it so the, um, you know, I, I could make the emails be a little more digestible, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of what led me down. And I'm still very much like, I don't do generally like kind of the, the crazy design emails personally, but I like having a bit of structure, especially nowadays where you find a lot of creators will have like, you know, oh, this email, this newsletter is sponsored this week by a company. Right. And you want to have like a nice, elegant way of like showing a little call out for that sponsor. And then you want to have like a referral area or a social share area or something like that. And um, obviously you could do it with just rich text and stuff like that. But I find, um, uh, again, I, I haven't done, I, I wouldn't say I've done this scientifically by any means, but personally, I, I, I find it a little easier to look at a testimonial, for instance, that is like set aside with like the photo of the person and the quote they said and and whatever else, rather than just like a, a paragraph of italic text that's like Joe's testimony or something. Um, and yeah, that, so I think that ends a little, little uh, that lends a little bit more credibility to testimonials too, right? That's what they say on, on landing pages, right? Don't just have the text, have uh, like a picture of the person if you can and make it stand yeah. out and- um, and that's the thing. I mean, yeah. sales pages are meant to convert people, right? Like they're right. meant to get people to buy. And and I don't, again, I know a lot of people will kind of scrappily set up like an initial sales page, maybe in Google Docs, but mm-hmm. eventually we tend to design it. We tend to make it a little more um, structured and, and laid out. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, the kind of the headlines, because people are going to skim, so catch their attention, use, you know, break things up with images, have those trust building sections like the logos and the um and it's funny that uh you men you've mentioned sales pages a couple of times right because i think there's also probably just like it's like simpler emails versus kind of more designed emails and um there's also like should how often should you sell to your email list right mm-hmm. what's the dance of of providing value Versus selling. Now, I I had Summer OS on um, a while ago, I think now, uh, earlier in in the year for sure. And she said, you know, don't sell in the the very first email, but you can kind of subtly mention your offers um, throughout and then you can have a a full sale sequence. So um, what's what's your kind of approach to to selling to your list? I'm on a couple of your newsletters and I don't feel it's heavy handed. So it's it no, feels so good I, to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't do um, the the usual way, I think, or not the usual, but the way I see a lot of people doing things is kind of the, the model of purely educational emails for a while. And then you kind of shut down the list and do a big launch every, every once in a while um, or a big promotion of something. And that's, you know, going back many years. I mean, that's what people like Ramit Sethi has done. Um, the, uh, you know, uh, I forgot the name of the guy. I think it's Joe Walker, the product launch formula uh, mm-hmm. guy. Yeah. And like that that kind of model, right? Of like, you do the educational, educational, educational to build up the trust and kind of uh, create, you know, I don't know, uh, indebtedness to all the good yeah. stuff they've given you or you've given them. Um, and then you kind of cash out <laughs> with it, with a big launch. My my preferred way, and, and this is, a, oh, to get back to Palladio, another reason I built Palladio um, is to do, to, leverage uh, segmentation and personalization to make it so I can do interesting things like, well, what do I know about Joe? Well, he's told me he uses ConvertKit. He told me he's at this stage of his business. He, you know, so on and so forth. Oh, he hasn't bought Mastering ConvertKit. So at the end of 
today's newsletter, he's going to happen to see a call to action or an ad, if you will, for that product of mine. Whereas somebody who uses, say, Active Campaign would not obviously see my ConvertKit course. Um, so I'm more of the model of I want to just show up every week and write a newsletter, write original content, and then let the uh, the call to action that that brings the money in um, be dynamically generated based off of who who's getting the email, what do I know about them, and also what have they bought or haven't bought. Um, so that's kind of the dynamic. It started out, it, I started calling it a dynamic PS way back when. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's kind of evolved into something where even now with with create and sell, I'm doing uh, things like where uh, I'm mixing that model in with my referral program. So if you refer people to my list, you get like store credit. Um, and then it also recommends a product. So if you've sent like 10 people to my list and you get $5 uh, referral, you'll see the price of the product I'm recommending to you discounted by $50 based off of um, your referrals. So that's that's my model. I much prefer just doing list-wide kind of blasts, if you will, of original content each week and then letting the call to actions be dynamically placed. Yeah, so that's really interesting, right? Um, and it, so is this a mix of your your other product? I, I don't know, your main product. Uh, a Right message. Right message. Or, yeah. And and this these sort of... Um, these templates, kind of. I'm I'm using right message as a uh, way on my thank you or my opt in pages or mm-hmm. post opt in pages to um, segment people, usually along like who are they and what are they looking for at the moment. So in my case, it's stuff like why did you join Create and Sell? Well, I'm struggling with building an audience. Cool. What do you use? I use ConvertKit. Awesome. How comfortable are you with ConvertKit? So I, I get into that kind of question uh, or questions, and I'm using right message for that. And then all that gets fed into their subscriber record. So the benefit there is I'm getting about 83% of all people who join going through that survey, mm-hmm. which means I'm starting with more than just, you know, this is Joe and this is his email address. I'm getting a bunch of other good info too that I can use to drive that engine. So feeding that initial seeding is done with right message, but everything else is 100% convert kit where I, um, I'm using a, a lot of liquid, which I'm using, frankly, Plotio to do. Uh, because Plotio is not only kind of a visual template builder, it's also a tool that um, includes a bunch of widgets, but also does stuff like liquid writing for you. Like it mm-hmm. still outputs liquid for ConvertKit or or whatever, but it lets you create that liquid in a way that doesn't make you write liquid code. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's that's what I'm doing is I'm I'm using internal data. So I'm obviously already tracking like what people have bought and haven't bought within convert it. Um, and then it, it becomes a matter of just using a bunch of liquid to say, cool, here's everything Joe's eligible for, but he's bought this, he's bought that. We're not going to pitch Palladio to him because he owns it. It'd be dumb. So we're going to pitch the other stuff to him. And um, yeah, it tends to, tends to work really well. This episode is brought to you by LearnDash. Look, I've been making courses for a long time. I've taught at the college level and I've created curriculums for several different organizations, including Udemy, Sessions College, and LinkedIn Learning. When I create my own courses, there's no better option than LearnDash. LearnDash combines cutting-edge e-learning tools with WordPress. They're trusted to power learning programs for major universities, small to mid-sized companies, startups, and creators worldwide. What makes LearnDash so great is it was created by and is run by people who deeply understand online learning and adds features that are truly helpful for independent course creators. I love the user experience. And now you can import Vimeo and YouTube playlists and have a course created automatically in seconds. I trust LearnDash to run my courses and membership, and you should too. Learn more at howibuilt.it slash LearnDash. Let's talk a quick philosophical question here because I know tags are what a lot of people use. I use them mostly because uh, it's... I mean, it's easier for me to implement, right? Even as a programmer, I just haven't taken the time to set up the right automations to use custom fields. But I know you are a big proponent of custom fields, or at least you were. Is that still the case? It's still the case, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so maybe you can tell us um, just like a 10,000 foot overview uh, 
why why are custom fields better? Can you do the same kind of stuff with tags? Because I know like tags, one of the reasons I use tags is because they're a little bit more exposed with the ConvertKit API. So mm-hmm. like automations are a little bit easier. Tagging is more easily automatable, I believe, um, than, than custom fields in certain cases. Yeah, so I'll get on my soapbox for a second. Yes, um, the you functionally they're they're identical. Um, mm-hmm. You can trigger automations by custom field changes. You can you know do all that kind of stuff. Some of the drawbacks though are integrations with ConvertKit often will only write tags, not fields. So you're kind of screwed there. Um, but the main reason that I tend to prefer custom fields is that often a lot of the what I'm using. So it all builds on a segmentation. Like we want to know this about this contact. Um, let, let's say you uh, have a segmentation data point, like what is somebody's number one problem? Mm-hmm. That could change. That that could change from you know over over the relationship of them being uh, on your list. Um, the issue with tags is that let's say to keep it e- easy, let's just inst- ditch the number one problem. Let's talk about favorite colors. So what's Joe's favorite color? And typically, people would say, "Well, I'm going to have a red tag, a green tag, a blue tag, whatever." The big issue is that if you are tagged red, meaning red's your favorite color, if that needs to change in the future, you end up needing to write cleanup automations that will mm-hmm. say when green is applied, go and remove red if if it exists, and remove blue if it exists, and then make you know leave them with green. Right. Tags clean up automatically. It's just like if if you know to go back to the programmer idea, you would never have a um, you would never have a, a SQL database that has a bunch of is blank fields. You would instead generally have things like um, some sort of state data about like, um, I don't know, plan, plan type, right? Like you'd have a field called plan type and the options would be like basic, you know, silver, bronze, gold, whatever. Yeah. Um, and typically that's that's how we model data things. So it's the same thing um, where custom fields automatically clean up and also, uh, if I wanted to track, let's say I want to track somebody's email service provider, there are the ones I'm tracking. I have an other option, but I, I also track up to ten different, you know, main things like convert kit, trip, active campaign, HubSpot, and so on. Um, that would that would mean I'd have eleven tags floating around, where instead I have one custom field. So it ends up being a lot cleaner. Um, and again, if they change, let's say they're they don't use an email service provider, and then. A month after my list, they click on my ConvertKit affiliate link, and now they use ConvertKit. And now I want to start pitching them on my ConvertKit stuff. Um, if I wanted to go from, if I wanted to tag them as ConvertKit, uh, I would need to go and remove the doesn't use anything tag, because otherwise, if I want to send a dedicated email to somebody and I, you know, uh, target people who are tagged don't use anything, well, what if they also have the tag ConvertKit? Like, which right. one is it? So it, yeah, it so- lends itself to ambiguity. Yeah, you need to create either segment or write in the email like uh, is tagged with don't use anything and also not tagged not with convert kit. Anything else. Yeah. And then it just it doesn't scale well yeah. at all. <laughs> and I mean from you know, from another kind of information gathering standpoint here, right? Um I think a cl- maybe a classic example you've used is membership, right? Y- you can tag somebody as a member and when they churn out, you can ta- you can remove that tag or you can have a custom field that's like current member or member okay. plan if you offer multiple plans or you can tag them as not a member or a uh, custom field can be not a member or it could be churned, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and so again, that's less cleanup because if you have member, not a member, churned, it's only going to be one of those things. Right. Yeah. I mean, the quintessential example there would be let's say you're track, you have like a membership site and you have a trial period and then you, they're an active customer. And you're using, say, you're using tags to drive all this and then they cancel. So you have trial applied. You need to then have logic that would say when they move to active, remove trial if it exists. And then likewise, when they go from active to canceled, remove active, apply canceled. But then the big issue is let's say they cancel and they go back to uh, sign up again like a few months down the road. Um, unless you have the logic in place that says when they go to sign up, also remove canceled if it exists, which you're probably going to forget to do that. Yeah. Um, then you send it, say you send a dedicated email campaign to everyone who's canceled. 
well, that that person might start getting emails from you saying, hey, come back. And they're like, I, I am back. I am back, um, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, for things like where you shouldn't truly have multiple states at once, that's where custom fields come into play. And you generally don't want multiple states at once should you want to do any sort of personalization. Because typically speaking, if if I want to track like what is Joe's number one priority at the minute, um, I don't want multiple answers. I want right. a single focus that I can then personalize the content that you get. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great way to put it, right? Cu- uh, custom fields are kind of like a one to one relationship. At any point, the custom field should represent one state. Tags. I'm using again tags for my multiple newsletters. Maybe somebody wants mm-hmm. my podcasting newsletter and my creator toolkits newsletter. And that's perfectly valid in yeah. this case for it. Yeah. So. Awesome. Yeah. I'm glad we went down that road because I think it's really important. Um, you know, I think I, I, I was, again, I was stuck in this until very recently. I was just kind of sending people one weekly personal newsletter, as Louis Nichols put it on his episode, right? Um, and those kind of like personal newsletters are a hard sell for anybody who doesn't know you personally. And so I finally... I did like the re reinitiate welcome email, like, hey, a lot has changed around here. I'm offering a few different things. Click on the statement that you think works best for you. And then I had a, you know, I'm sending, I want emails about podcasts. I want emails about site building or I want it all, right? Um, and then if they hadn't clicked, it was kind of based on what form they signed up for. Um, mm-hmm. and, and again, that's been working really well for me, but the personalization and the segmentation really, if you want to grow your newsletter, which I think you should, I think that's really important. Yep. Agreed. Awesome. Uh, so we kind of mentioned, right, uh, it used to be conventional wisdom to send simpler emails um, because they looked like they were from real people. Um, that said, you know, I feel like another common thing people are doing with these emails is like sending like one sentence as paragraph and then having like 20 paragraphs. And I just like... It feels like a very panicked way to write and read. <laughs> and I don't I don't think you I don't think you do this, right? Yours are very like long form writing, if I recall correctly. Yeah, no, I, I definitely I mean, I'll sometimes have a short paragraph. Um, yeah. I'm not I'm not doing Victorian era style, you know, half yeah. page long paragraphs. Yeah. But um no, I mean I, I think and, and, and that's a digestibility thing. Cause I, I do right. think to your point, I mean it's it's easier for me as a reader to digest short bits then um and you find this a lot with like or in the internet marketing side of things i think where yes. they'll have like these very yeah. yeah you know what i mean um you walk into a store period new line you see the shelves are empty period yeah. new line like oh my god yeah. it yeah empty store, and that, empty that, store. that's all that's for <laughs> is for digestibility right yeah so i mean it, it definitely has its place and i think it works but i try to do more straight up like i'm not as Baity, I think, with the content that I try to send. Mm-hmm. So I want it to just be almost more of like a slow burn. Like if you're legitimately getting value for me each and every week, then my expectation is at one point you'll probably buy something and then hopefully you'll buy more. And that's kind of my MO with this stuff. Yeah. Awesome. I, I love that. And I think it's, um, I, I really like that if you're getting value from me. And um, I think one of the, Again, one of the things that I've kind of uh, gleaned from you, because I saw this section in your newsletter and I was curious about it, was um, the referral section. And I'm using Sparkloop. You're using Sparkloop. I've mm-hmm. uh, I've explicitly paid for ConvertKit Pro just for the Sparkloop integration. Like it just financially yeah. makes sense that way. Yeah. Um, and then I also get the benefit of being able to like fix links that are broken later. <laughs> um, yeah. So. You talk about, you know, if you're getting value from me, it's a little bit more of a slow burn. How important um, is, how important do you think referrals are to this whole strategy? And then uh, secondarily, I guess, how important is it to make the referral section stand out? Maybe that's like a a, a softball for you, but, um, <laughs> you know, cause you could just have like a refer this, right. It could be just like text, but you've yeah. put time and effort into making a couple of different referral widgets that I think really stand out. Well, that, that's me again. I, I mean, I mentioned a second ago, I try not to do baity things. This is absolutely where I do baity things <laughs> with um, that. The, the widget in question that you're referring to is, kind of this leaderboard style, um, not even leaderboard, there's no competition, but it's more of a gamified 
like progress bar, you're this far away from the next tier um, thing. And, and quite a few people have picked it up, um, probably the biggest being James Clear. Mm-hmm. And what, what's, what's cool about it is uh, I wanted to have something that would be a bit more than, than what you, you were implying of like this simple plain texting. I wanted to have a proper area at the footer of an email that would then be able to show somebody like, here's what you're tracking toward next. And that's where Liquid comes into play because that'll be personalized based off what tier they're on. Um, and it's kind of like if you, um, I mean, I, I wrote a, a few weeks back an email about this to my list about, I don't know if, if when you were in, in like middle school or, or elementary, you did that like magazine sale thing um, <laughs> where, you know, you'd get like these thresholds you'd hit, right? Of like, when you sell this much, you get like, the you know this toy or something and then mm-hmm. you sell a bit more and you get another toy yeah and that's kind of how i've always seen like the spark loop model of like these different tiers that you track toward so i wanted a way where instead of it just saying you're you've done zero or three or two or three or whatever i wanted to have a proper like um a more horizontal version of those vertical ones that elementary schools all over have of like, you know, this is how big we're getting to the top. Yeah. And then once we hit there, we get the new playset or something on the playground. Um, so I wanted, I wanted something like that because I knew it would work. I knew it would be visually a lot more effective. And, and it, I th- it absolutely is proven true because people keep using it and they're ditching what they're, they have been doing it for that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's what I wanted. Um, and then that, that's where it started. But then there's also a lot of other interesting ways that I've found to leverage Sparkloop. Um, one of the more recent ones has been, you know, you know, the like click to tweet stuff you see on blog posts all the time. Mm-hmm. Well, I wanted to build a equivalent of that, that you could embed as a widget in an email. And the benefit would be it would automatically include your Sparkloop referral link in it. Right. So you could say like, you know, put a click to tweet, like in line in the middle of an email they click that, they tweet it out, and they're getting any any um, they're getting attributed for anyone who who clicks through to, um, on that thing you just tweeted. Yeah. So that's less of a like general share my newsletter, and more of a share this interesting concept I just shared from the you know this part of the newsletter. Um, and yeah, it's just a lot of fun ways that you can you can you can do stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely think Spark Loop's been instrumental for me. Um, on a good month, I'm getting about 11, 12% of all new referrals or all oh, new wow. options from Sparkloop, which isn't, I mean, there are people who do much better th- at that than I do. I think one thing I haven't touched yet that I want to at some point would be like giveaways and mm-hmm. more intentional campaigns. But yeah. mine have always just been kind of passive things at the footer of every newsletter, a little thing. Um, although with Create and Sell, I've, I've actually retired my famous switch thing um, in favor of that referral or recommended product engine I, I mentioned. Yeah, where, I noticed that. And I'm, yeah. I'm really glad you mentioned it because I wasn't sure if you like you were recommending. The it's a test. I, I don't know. Yeah. I actually don't know. Um, you know, the, the big picture thing, which I, I hinted at is you re- refer people to my list. There are no more tiers. There's no more like send 10 people and get this prize. Yeah. Instead, it's for every person you send, you'll get this much credit. And then here's a recommended product for you with your credit applied if you have it. Um, so it kind of bakes in all of it into one, but, um, I, I haven't done like the, I've ditched in that case, the progress bar in favor of the big recommended thing with then, uh, text under it about how to get credit. Um, yeah. and it's stuff like, you know, Hey, if you have a podcast, let's, let's, I'll go on it and we can include my, you know, your link basically. Yeah. We haven't talked about this, but we probably should. Well, <laughs> so I, mean, for this, I definitely yeah. will. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, but like things like that, uh, yeah. you know, if, if, if you like this article, here's the permalink for it. Go ahead and share this in your next newsletter since most people on my list are creators and mm-hmm. they have their own newsletters. Yeah. Um, and and I, I've, I've been using that in favor of the thing that most people buy Palladio for, to be honest. But it's, yeah. it's a test. I don't have enough data to know if I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah, I mean, it feels good though, right? Because it's very, it's very concrete and consistent, right? Like, you know, my mm-hmm. my um, rewards right now are like, I don't know, like a free ebook and then like a free membership for a year and then like a consulting call with me. And like, if nobody cares about the ebook or the membership and they just want to get the consulting call, now it kind of feels like a, a slog to have to get yeah. to that many. Whereas yeah. like, if I say, 
hey, you're going to get credit to Joe Casabona Inc. and you can use it for the membership or you can keep saving and get a free consulting call with me. Uh, yeah. Like that's, that's fine too. And then you can have that, that vertical bar like you'd have in. And every, everyone right. likes discounts too. So yeah, you can right. say yeah. like, you know, here, here's Joe's like, um, you know, some, some product for yours that you've got. And yeah. if it's regularly like a hundred dollars, you could say like, you know, it's 70 for you because you've sent me six people or right. whatever the value is for yeah. a referral. And, and, and that's the other yeah. thing, right? You're, you're, you are assigning a value to each email address. Um, mm-hmm. And then you're kind of forced to think about, because this was the first thing I did, like the like the onboarding call with Sparkloop. And they were like, well, how much is each, each subscriber worth to you? That's how you should determine your rewards. And I'm like, I have no freaking idea. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I had to think about that. Like, and, how much and it's is, one of those things yeah. where, you know, I don't, yeah, I'm I'm making less money, but the question is always, would I have gotten that sale if they didn't, if they weren't incentivized with the discount because of the referrals that they've made, whether it be right. intentional or not? And, um, and you know, I got more people on my list and I, I've only, I've had a, Spark Loop does a good job at doing kind of anti fraud stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've absolutely seen like a few people who have done like, you know, blasted it out to their Telegram group and none of the people who have joined are like the kind of people that should be on my list, but they're real people. Yeah. So I'm not, I never know, like, I just kind of let it, let it slide. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that's the other big thing too. But, but it's not like you can cash out. I think when I was talking publicly on Twitter about doing this, people were like, oh, well, what if, can it be abused? And I'm like, well, it can really only be abused that potentially somebody gets stuff, my stuff for free or alternatively at a big discount. And the fact is I'm selling digital products. So my margin is like 97%. Right. Um, so, like, if they get it for 40% off, like, I'm still okay at the end of the day. Um, it's not like with physical inventory or something, right? So, yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's like the, that really is like the affiliate model, right? I mean, up until recently, ConvertKit was giving you like 30% of uh, every for life. dollar, yeah. right, that they made yeah. off somebody you've referred. And, uh, honestly, you know, there was, I was vocal about that on Twitter. I try not to, to piss and moan on Twitter as much anymore as I did in my younger days. But, uh, you know, that one really got me because, um, it was a very sudden change change yeah. that uh, could have a big effect on, on creators bottom lines. Right. And so I certainly, I think after six months, right. Your job has, is now done, right. You've got people onto the platform and if they stick around for six months, now they like the product. Yeah. Um, but for a while, I was like, they. I mean, they must be just making money because everybody I refer is now, maybe they're referring other people or they're, it, it was just an interesting, it, it felt like an interesting model because they were losing 30% off the top of everybody I was referring. Um, yeah. And that felt like yeah. a big cut. Um, yeah. So, uh Awesome. Well, I, this has been a great conversation. The last thing I want to ask you about is not really related to uh, like designs or, or referral sections, which by the way, again, at the show notes at how I built that it slash two, six, seven, I will have, these will be affiliate links to Brennan's create and sell newsletter. I think it's really good. I strongly recommend it. I've learned a ton. Um, as well as, as spark loop, because I'm, I'm using that now and, and I'm, I'm, approaching my list building for that. And this next question is kind of based on that. Um, evergreen versus kind of one-off segmented emails. I have a new newsletter called Podcast Tips at getpodcast.tips. This is an evergreen newsletter that I'm also using pri- uh, I'm using Sparkloop primarily with, right? Uh, I don't know mm-hmm. if you could set up different campaigns in Sparkloop, a cursory look sh- uh, turned up empty for me. Um, so I'm only using it with this one newsletter cause it's like a very targeted, Hey, do you want to send more podcast tips to people? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also evergreen, right? So when people get referred, they get put to the top of the stack. What's your opinion on kind of evergreen versus one off? Is there a feature in convert kit I'm missing where like, I can like pause the evergreen segment to insert a more timely email or anything like that? Uh, yes, you can. So the, um, yeah, so I've, this is something I, I've been doing for myself for 
a while only because I, I call it a shattered newsletter, but it's, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. But the idea is that for a lot of us, what we're sending isn't that like doesn't change. It's not like we're, we're not sending like, right. We're not like morning stock brew. market stuff where it like <laughs> yeah, right. changes yeah. every day. Right. Like yeah. this, this is stuff that's, it's pretty evergreen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, my, my thinking is that the problem I have with live newsletters, and again, I great and sell is still a live newsletter, whereas W freelancing is not a live newsletter. It's mm-hmm. a shadow newsletter at this point. But the, the big, the big issue I have as a consumer of a live newsletter is the same issue I have with blogs where when you go to like a typical blog, you see it by date ordering, right? Like the most recent article and from there on, you know, the other stuff. Whereas if I'm, if I'm somewhere new and I want to learn from a brand or a company or a person, my thinking is I want something a bit more curated. And with an evergreen or a shadow newsletter, you can do that. You can say, well, here's, you know, three months worth or a year's worth of content that I've written. And it makes sense to order it in a certain way rather than just kind of the usual newsletter thing of like whatever I happen to write this week and send it out yeah. is what you get regardless of how long you've been on the list regardless of how familiar you are with like what I talk about and so on so I really like um, Evergreen for that it, it, I, I find it to be a better user experience and you can combine it with things like the upfront segmentation we talked about of like you know case in point one of the things I ask is how experienced are you with email marketing. Well, if somebody's really experienced, maybe it makes sense for them to skip some like preliminary stuff that other people might get. And these other these things other people might get could look like a weekly newsletter, right? Like I can I can change the uh the ordering if you will and mm-hmm. say like you get on this track if this is your need, you get on that track if this is your need. And then once you've exhausted these tracks, you go to like a generic track or a general track. And, um, and then, you know, you just go from there. And, um, I, again, I find that because you can still do all this stuff I talked about with like dynamic call to actions and like your referral area and stuff like the end user doesn't know or care potentially that you didn't write that this morning and hit send. Right. Like as long as the, the content is what they need at that point. Awesome. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan. And, um, that's actually how, when I started Write Message, I was able to step away from W, w Freelancing. Because W Freelancing did, you know, it, ha- it has a 52-week Evergreen newsletter. That's a year. So I can, the benefit there is somebody can go join the list today. And I don't need to show up at all. And they're right. getting weekly newsletters for me every, every week for a whole year. And the benefit there was I could then go and start Write Message and focus on that while having minimal impact to sales because all that stuff kept happening on the on the W freelancing side of things. Um, and to quickly answer your question about the technical thing of like, what if I have like an urgent, not urgent, but like a, I want to send this out to everyone. Yeah, um, a timely thing. Well, yeah. you could either do the easy thing, which is just send two newsletters that week or mm-hmm. one live and they'll get the evergreen, um, which is just more content from Joe, maybe not a bad thing. Or the more complex thing would be um, ConvertKit sequences will not send emails somebody's already received by default. So you could technically do a bulk operation that would um, remove everyone from your sequence. That is the Evergreen newsletter. Gotcha. And uh, send your broadcast. And then like after that, put them all back in that and they'll they'll filter down to where they left off or where they were before. Um and that's typically the the traditional way of of doing something like that because that makes sense. I mean, I've always thought, for instance, uh, one of the things I talked about a few weeks ago in my newsletter was having a kill switch where, mm-hmm. like the, um, it could be as simple as just like I don't. Let's say you send out every Saturday on your Evergreen newsletter, and this Saturday happens to be Christmas Day. You know, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe you just want to skip a week, right? Right. So you could do that. You could you could use this to do that because your automation doesn't know. The problem with automation is it only looks at relative date intervals. It doesn't right. know that you know Ukraine just got invaded today, or that right. it's Christmas Day, or something like that. So um, that that's why I'm a big proponent of having systems that can say like you know shut it down type thing, um, and, and and having that easily done. Yeah, you know it's funny. I got flack for sending an email on Thanksgiving Day. 
Uh, and someone was like, I just don't like to be disturbed on Thanksgiving Day. And I'm like, I'm not disturbing you. I didn't send you a push <laughs> notification. Right. You right. checked your email app. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they're they're <laughs> sneaking away from the kitchen table yeah. to uh, to see what 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 who's emailing them. Yeah. I mean, that's I mean, to be honest, nowadays with Black Friday starting like not on Black Friday. Right. Everyone right. should be used to that anyway. So Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by WP Wallet. Do you manage websites for clients? Do you feel on the hook for the cost of premium plugins? WP Wallet fixes that. WP Wallet is a free, simple, intelligent tool that helps WordPress professionals like you manage all your license keys and invoices for all your sites and clients. Sign up for a free account, connect a website, and WP Wallet automatically scans that site for plugins and marks the premium ones, even adding prices. No more making the decision of buying the plugin yourself or talking your client through the purchase process. WP Wallet gives you the best of both worlds. As someone who's managed multiple WordPress sites with premium plugins, this tool is a lifesaver. It will even allow you to send recurring invoices to your clients that can be paid on the spot. Never forget a renewal, lose a license key, or miss out on a reimbursement again. Join WP Wallet for free at wpwallet.com slash Joe. I like how you call it like a shadow newsletter. Um, so, you know, more people want something more created, having a kill switch. And and it's funny. It's also funny that you mentioned the typical blog thing because uh, I just on one of my websites pinned or like made a bunch of posts sticky. Mm. Like usually it's like one that's like the important one. I made like five sticky because I'm like, these are the five most important topics I want people to see on in, on this blog. Yeah. Everything else is like to keep the content machine going for Google or yeah. whatever. Yeah, to feed Google. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and again, I, I think like I, the, the way I look at it or the way I think about it often is if your weekly newsletter is kind of like a, a rushing river, mm-hmm. if somebody just joins today, you throw them head first. Let's say you're doing like a series. Like this is, the second email of like a three-part series you're sending. If they just jump in at that point, it's going to be a bit confusing. Um, where I, I, that's why I really like having something that before you get in, say this week is a really technical kind of geeky thing, might be the wrong email to start with um, for somebody. And obviously you probably have onboarding emails and so on. And this would just be an extension of that. So you would have like your, welcome emails and so on and so forth. You could even have like a early on pitch, um, but then you can segue them into a, um, a shadow newsletter. And then, yeah, you could just go from there and just keep appending to that. And um, I always find it easy. Like what I, what I try to optimize for is how little can I log in to convert it? Yeah. Um, because the more you're not logging in to convert it, the more you can be heads down building your products or focusing on, focusing on acquisition or, going on a cruise, yeah. <laughs> you know, like they're there. Yeah. It, but, but at the end of the day, I, I don't th- no recipient, unless you're sending like temporal Bitcoin update emails or something like if you're, if you're teaching people marketing, it like doesn't change that frequently. Yeah. Right. That's, that's exactly right. And I do, I have a recurring reminder in Todoist uh, every four weeks to add more emails to that sequence. Right. Is mm-hmm. kind of a, you know, I've I've got like I think three months leeway. I don't want to get too far behind, especially for like the very first people who joined. Um, but you're right. You know, you look at ConvertKit, and again, the pro ConvertKit Pro is like 790 bucks a year. And coming from the WordPress space, people will say, "Well, that's really expensive." But um, first of all, I can justify that cost just from the sales I got on my Black Friday sale, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, ConvertKit helped me make more than that. So they've paid for them. But like, like you said, if I don't have to log into ConvertKit to do things now, I'm now they're justifying their value by giving me hours back. Right. So if I'm Mm -hmm. charging 200 bucks an hour, well, now they've justified themselves in less than a day. Yeah. And I I think, I think the big thing that might be a good way to kind kind of close out this theme would be, I think oftentimes when people think about automation, so that's, that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. Is it being something that's better for us, the marketer, the creator, whatever. It allows us to go sit on the beach with the Corona and not, you know, do stuff. Right. But we, we often don't think about the recipient, how automation done well 
means that you can say, well, what do I know about this person? I know this, this, and this. What, uh, what would make sense to send them first? Then what should they get next? And then what should they get promoted at this point? And so on, which is better than like the live broadcast model of like, oh, Joe's calendar happens to say that this week he's doing a big list-wide pitch, but I just joined yesterday. And now I just joined this list. I was eager to join. I'm going to learn a bunch of new stuff. And all this guy's doing is trying to sell me stuff. Right. Like, I think there's there's something to be said about automation done right can be uh, a lot more tasteful than the live uh, schedule-led or calendar-led way of doing things is. Yeah, that I mean, that's that's such a great point, right? You you want to use your newsletter to build trust, and if someone signs up and then the first email they get is "I'm having this big sa- this big time limited sale," yeah, that does yeah. the opposite, right? Exactly. Um, but that's that kind of shotgun approach of hoping, just blast it out to the list and hope. Yeah, you're going to piss off new people who might not be ready to buy, but hopefully you'll get enough sales that you won't yeah. care at the end of the day. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and and I think, like you said, the next step for for me, something it sounds like you're already doing, is segmenting this podcast list further to be like in that first email, hey, where are you on your podcast journey? And then dropping them into a... Uh, the appropriate segment, right? So if they're starting, yeah. have a sequence of emails for tips for starting. But if they already have one, those people can skip those 10 or 12 emails and just get right into the, I want more downloads or I want to get my first sponsor. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And which which makes, you know, perfect, perfect sense, right? Like it, you should be sending more relevant content to people. Yeah. And uh, live newsletters make that hard. Right, yeah, and and again, just to um, to to wrap this up, my live newsletter is my personal newsletter, right? And again, like like we said earlier, people who know me are interested, right? This is the content I made in the past week. These are some of the things I'm trying, uh, and here's here's kind of the stuff I'm working on for my membership for this week. If you want to sign up, but by and large. I mean, especially the last 50 or so people who've just signed up for my list don't know me. They signed up from yeah. a tweet I sent. And so yeah. I want to I want to provide a ton of value for them. Yeah, yeah, which, yeah. And then you yeah. can, and the benefit too is when you really go down the rabbit hole, you can be doing automated pitches that are based more on when you joined or when you, you right. kind of uh, did certain actions that indicated a lot of interest. And then the benefit for you as a creator is you're used to like, no sales, spike in sales, no sales, spike in sales, right? But I tend to prefer, even though that's really fun, it's nice knowing you make like a lot of money in a week. Yeah. I like more steady yeah. <laughs> uh, stuff, you know, which which this this allows for. Yeah. Yes. As somebody with steady bills, right? I would like something yeah. more steady as well. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if the if the net if the net result is more because they're getting pitched when they're ready to be pitched rather than on, yeah. on your schedule. It means more net sales, which right. we all like. Yeah, because that's the other thing, right? Like if, if you're doing a, a, a flash sale or whatever and someone signs up for my membership or buys my course because this is the best price they're going to get it at, but they're not ready to take it yet. Yeah. Well, now they've wasted their money, right? Yeah, now they're probably exactly. not going to buy my cohort-based course because they didn't get value from the last thing they bought from me. Right, right. And that's exactly it. And yeah. we all know how important it is to you know, when somebody gets something recommended at the right time, they buy it, and then they're successful with it, the likelihood of them going on to buy more and to tell people about what you've got and kind of that whole thing is just so much more likely to happen. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's win win for everybody. It's a win for everybody there. Awesome. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Brendan, this has been great. Um, I, I, you know, I mean, you shared a lot with us, but I it is now a seven year habit almost of me asking uh, my favorite question, which is, do you have any trade secrets for us? Trade secrets. Uh, and I'm pretty, I don't have anything that secret um, in that I'm not like ardently public about it on yeah. uh, social media. But I think, I think the big thing is um, I wouldn't call it a secret as much as an advantage. And that is um, uh, started out in software development turning, you know, went into marketing and um, applying all the stuff that us coders do all the time to say emails or sales pages can be super effective. So yeah, just being able to do things like saying, show this case study excerpt in a pitch email. If Joe 
uses WordPress, but if he uses Ghost, maybe show that other thing. Mm. Um, and that kind of stuff, which is kind of the things that, like we all do naturally. Like if I'm at a conference and I'm talking to you and I find out this, this, and this about you, I'm absolutely changing. Like the, if you ask me about my business, I'll describe it differently to you than right. I would maybe somebody else. And uh, that that's the stuff that I think uh, it's just a little code that allows it to happen. And uh, it can go it can go pretty far. So, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome, right? Because you usually hear the opposite, right? Like programmers are bad at marketing. Coders are bad at marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, but we don't have to be. We can take the the way we think and apply it to marketing in a very uh, effective way. Um, exactly. Brennan, this has been such a great conversation. If people want to learn more about you, where can they find you? Uh, so the best place would probably be createandsell.co. Um, I do have, as of actually today, a, at palladio.dev, D-E-V, a opt-in, which eventually will turn into like a proper marketing site for for the product. Uh, but Create and Sell is like my weekly newsletter, and I'll talk a lot about email and everything we talked about. Um, uh, that's probably the best place. I'm also on Twitter at Brennan Dunn. Awesome. And uh, you can find links to everything that we talked about, uh, as well as a way to get ad-free extended episodes. Brendan and I will talk for a few minutes and build something more about how he built Palladio. Um, you can find all of that at howibuilt.it slash 267, full disclosure. The create and sell link in the show I was notes. Say, don't, don't use the vocal thing I just said. <laughs> <laughs> go, to, go to the permalink for the episode and click that link. <laughs> yes, that will, be in a, that will be a referral link uh, that will get yep. me some money off of. Uh, eventually, I'll, be, I'll buy Mastering Convert Kit as I'm like, yes, I want to I wanna do more. Um, yeah. So that'll re- that will help me greatly if you do that. And then there'll be links to Spark Loop and a bunch of other stuff we talked about. But, uh, but that's it for this episode of How I Built It. Brennan, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Joe. And thank you for listening. Thanks to our sponsors. Until next time, get out there and build something. <laughs>